I was a little confused when I saw this um, uh, topic on, on the agenda because this is a cardiology conference. Um, but um, what's interesting in listening to all the talks, it kind of actually falls into place because uterine trans the uterine transplant program we have here is really uh, the epitome of a, of a multidisciplinary program and uh, teamwork. And I think those are concepts that we've emphasized today as to what we do. And I think this is just another example of that here at, at the Cleveland Clinic. So, um, so the first question, I guess, is, you know, the same question I have, and you're probably asking yourselves this, is why on earth would you transplant a uterus? Um, and I, I thought the same thing. But um, so to get to the answer, um, you have to look at something called uterine factor infertility. So this is a cause of infertility. Um, and it's, it's noted to be as high as one in 500 reproductive age women. So there's a sizable population here if you look um, across, the, across the globe. Um, and the etiology, it can be variable, but uh, one common is a, is a congenital absence of the uterus, which is called meyer rokitansky kuster hauser syndrome, uh, or MRKH syndrome, um, which happens, um, you know, is, is, is seen uh, in the largest proportion of these women. Um, there's also I iatrogenic uh, removal of the uterus for different reasons, and then damage from the infection or surgery, which... Um, can lead to a uterus not being um, able to um, carry a pregnancy. So uh, the interesting thing is with most of these patients, they do have functioning ovaries. So traditionally, the only options that they've had are uh, adoption or use of in vitro fertilization and, a gest and then a gestational carrier. Now, this is not satisfactory for a lot of patients because of various reasons, personal, religious, uh, legal, financial, or ethical reasons. So, um, so uterine transplantation then is the promise of a new way to potentially provide treatment. Um, the history actually goes back some time now. So the first uh, living donor uterine transplant was done uh, in Saudi Arabia, actually in 2002, um, and was successful um, technically, it just, uh, uh, but failed um, a few months later um, uh, because of um, infection. Um, uh, in 2011, the first uh, live donor, successful live donor uterine transplant um, uh, occurred. And from my understanding, the uterus is still in, in, in situ, uh, but they've not been able to get pregnant. There were two pregnancies, both ended in miscarriage. Um, 2013 was the first was the uh, a trial launched in Sweden was the first clinical trial involving living donor uterine transplants, and that resulted in 2015 the first uh, live birth from a living donor uterine transplant. Um, in 2016, here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, we performed the first deceased donor uh, transplant, um, and that also uh, unfortunately was unsuccessful due to a uh, post-operative complication and infectious complications. So, um, and so that uh, uterus was removed, had to be removed a few days after uh, transplant. Um, then in, um, the, the, so the first living uh, donor transplant was in Sweden in 2017, the first uh, living uh, donor uterine transplant, uh, live birth from that uh, occurred here in, in Dallas. And then uh, the first uh, live birth from a deceased donor uterine transplant occurred in 2018 in Brazil. And then here in the United States, we actually had another uh, deceased donor uh, uterine transplant, the first one in the U.S. that resulted in a live birth in 2019. So just kind of a, 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 a brief history. And uh, to date, there have been about roughly 50 uh, uterine transplants performed worldwide um, at last check. Uh, so some considerations, um, and there will be some parallels here uh, uh, going forward with the heart transplant talk that, that Alistair gave. But um, in terms of, you know, uh, considerations as far as a recipient goes, uh, they typically have a, a complete gynecologic assessment and reproductive assessment and, you know, including, you know, an assessment for renal, uh, if they have MRKH syndrome, it's associated with renal anomalies. They have to know if that's the case. Uh, we had a patient that had um, pelvic uh, 
bilateral pelvic kidneys uh, associated with that and therefore was not deemed a candidate for a uterine transplant. Um, also, they, they need to be of reproductive age, not have other major comorbidities. Their emotional and psychological well-being also is we, must be assessed, and as well as social support, because um, there's a lot these patients uh, need to do. Uh, and then they're required, uh, they need to be fertile, and we'll talk about the steps, but they, ha they have to do in vitro fertilization and be able to create at least six to 10 embryos. And I'll go over that schematically here in a second, the whole process. Um, and as far as a donor, if, if you're using whether it's a living or, or, or deceased donor, it's, you would want someone who's in good overall health. And then in terms of their gynecologic or reproductive history, um, it's the, uh, we try to avoid folks who have significant cervical dysplasia just because of the immuno, immunosuppression, um, uh, HPV uh, you know, infection that's associated with that. Um, and then we avoid uh, patients who would have a prior C-sections or poor obstetrical history, and then other uterine abnormalities, fibroids, polyps, uh, et cetera. Um, so this is sort of a, just a schematic of the, of the transplant process. Um, initially, the uh, couple um, undergo in vitro fertilization. And again, they try to get like um, six to 10 embryos that are there. Um, the, uh, uh, then uh, the transplant is performed um, with the uterus from the donor going into the recipient. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, then there's a period of time where uh, we have to make sure that the recipient uh, is, is tolerating the transplant and uh, there isn't a significant rejection there. They, these patients are put on uh, immunosuppressive medication. Uh, the regimen initially is, uh, is one that's not uh, able to be used in pregnancy. So um, there are biopsies of the cervix that are performed routinely to, to check for rejection. Uh, after six, a period of six months to a year, uh, the recipient is then, <clears throat> if they don't have significant reception, they're, re rejection, they're switched to a different regimen of immunosuppression that's uh, more suitable for pregnancy. Uh, and then the embryo transfer occurs and, and then hopefully pregnancy and a successful delivery. The uterus, in the uh, cases that we've had here at the Cleveland Clinic, we've done a hysterectomy following the delivery. Um, but in theory, um, you, you can uh, do, the protocol calls for up to, you can allow for up to two pregnancies in a five-year period because um, you want to limit immunosuppression in these patients. So again, there's two different approaches. We talk about a living donor versus a deceased donor. Um, <clears throat> benefits of the donor is you can have optimal screening and preparation. Uh, you can also schedule inconvenience and there's, because uh, it can be in different separate ORs right next to each other. Um, and there's shorter cold ischemia time. Uh, th some of the downsides are uh, donors tend to be older. In fact, uh, in the Swedish uh, trial that was done, some, uh, many of the donors were actually the mothers giving their uterus to the daughter. So you have postmenopausal and uh, so they're older. Uh, and that can have issues in terms of the vascular uh, supply to the uterus. Uh, and also there's the big concern is morbidity to the donor from the hysterectomy. Because um, as I'll show you in a slide later, they need to try to get like wider vascular pedicles than what they normally get with a hysterectomy. And that uh, leads to uh, greater risk for complications. With the deceased donor, um, obviously you don't have the, the time for the, the screening of the patient. So the history often has to be obtained from prior medical records or the family and not directly from the patient. Um, there are obviously logistical uh, limitations. The first uterus that, deceased donor uterus that was used here at a Cleveland Clinic, uh, that came from Florida. So they had to fly down to procure the uterus and bring it back, which may be common with other organs, but Very yeah. But, uh, but anyway, it didn't work. So, um, but that lo those logistical limitations uh, are there. Donor availability. I mean, m most uh, people are, or women, you know, aren't thinking about donating their uterus, you know, with organs, and it's not. And many families aren't aren't necessarily uh, up for that. So that that can be a problem. Uh, however, the benefits are that it really allows, uh, uh, eliminates the surgical risks to the donor and allows for a wider uh, dissection and larger vessel segments, which help with the, uh, with the surgery. Um, the vascular support for the transplanted uterus uh, 
is typically the, the uterine artery and the vein, which are connected to the external iliac, um, uh, you know, the, the external iliac artery and vein. Um, the, um, <clears throat> sometimes instead of the external iliac vein, which is kind of a hard thing to harvest, um, they use the ovarian vein for drainage, uh, and that's been, that technique has been performed. Um, you know, the big things, again, are the ischemic times with, you know, transport of the, of the uterus. And then postoperatively, as I talked about, immunosuppression uh, is, is needed, and then uh, <clears throat> the embryo transfer after a period of many months that we know that the, tr the, the graft is stable and not showing signs of rejection. There are a number of immunosuppressive agents that you can use. Um, there is some that we don't use in, in, in pregnancy, but are used in the immediate post-operative period for the transplant patient. So mycophenolate is one that we don't use because it's teratogenic and embryopathy, but we will uh, use it and typically stop it um, and change the regimen um, uh, to other agents and, um, and watch for rejection. And then if there's no rejection, then they'll go ahead and try to uh, move forward with conception. Um, these are just some general recommendations obstetrically for transplant patients. Um, and you have to monitor uh, immunosuppressive drug levels with the increasing changes in pregnancy. Um, again, this comes from other solid pregnancy outcomes following other transplant uh, solid organ transplants. And, and the key things here are there's a higher risk for um, low birth weight, for prematurity, for hypertensive complications in pregnancy um, so with, uh, with many types of transplants, uh, especially kidney transplants, which, you know, had the greatest experience with. Um, so again, <clears throat> after uterine transplant uh, and the things to think about immunosuppression, um, and then these vascular anastomoses are, are really tested because during pregnancy, the blood supply to the uterus increases um, to about 750 milliliters per minute, which is 25% of the cardiac output roughly at term. So these um, uh, the anastomoses really have to hold up. And the concern then is, is that you can get placental ischemia if you, if you don't have a good circulation there in the uterus, and that leads to problems like IUGR and preeclampsia or fetal growth restriction, preeclampsia. So um, here's our experience here at um, the Cleveland Clinic um, to date with the uterine transplant program. We've had two successful, um, so we've had um, seven transplants total. We've had um, one that failed uh, immediately after, um, but we've had two others that have had successful pregnancies, and here, here's kind of the specifics. Both were delivered around uh, 34 weeks. And, uh, the one first was delivered due to a placental, uh, pre, placenta previa and a complication called placenta accreta, which is where the uh, placenta actually grows into the wall of the uterus, uh, and it's kind of a very high-risk uh, situation. But again, it, it looks at the ischemia within the uterus is probably the predisposing factor to that. And then this year, we had a, a delivery um, in March of, a, again, almost 35-week uh, infant. And again, the pregnancy was complicated by hypertension. Both uh, children have done well and are developing normally. There have been no, both moms had hysterectomies and had no complication. Uh, we have four other successful transplants um, that are at various stages of pre-pregnancy evaluation or somewhere in the embryo transfer process. And I suspect we'll have a few more pregnancies this year um, that we'll have to manage. So again, uh, so just to close, um, uterine transplantation has rapidly advanced and it's uh, to be at where it's now a clinically experimental procedure. Our, um, our initial, our protocol or our study that we have allows for 10, uh, we're gonna do 10 procedures um, to, and, and then we'll have the results of that and we'll be able to then offer it hopefully for more. Um, and again, our, that's our clinical trial, and there, but there seems to be a significant demand. There's a, a very large number of patients that are asking for this. Um, and of course, there's the question of living versus deceased donor, which is better, and that's still gonna remain. Uh, things that we need to continue to have are long-term follow-up of living donors, uh, of the recipients. What are the impact, what's the impact of this? transplant and then 
how are the children going to do long term thank you very much